My name is um, John White and I'm Emeritus Professor of Philosophy Education at UCL IOE and um, I'm um, Honorary Vice President of the uh, PSGB and I've been on the editorial board of the journal for uh, since 1988. And I'm Judith Suisa, I've been on the editorial team of the journal since 2007. Well, as it is 50 years since the journal was first established, um, I thought it would be interesting to go back to the early years and ask you, as someone who's been involved for some time, whether you <laughs> could reflect on what the journal was like in the early years and how you experienced it. Well, origi originally it was um, modelled on the proceedings of the Aristotelian Society mm. and like it, it, it at first just produced um, uh, um, papers given at the annual conference, mm. so it broadened out a bit after that. It was very much um, a, a, a GB-centred um, organisation and journal at that time. Um, and this was because of the, the important role that philosophy education had in the new teacher reform programme that the Labour government brought in the mid-60s. And um, b because teachers in those days were wholly responsible for their aims and, mm. and their curriculum and their pedagogy and so on, um, our job was to encourage them to, to reflect on these things and we felt that we were part of a, of a kind of a, an important national program what mm. Peter used to call the mission um, and the journal played a, a huge role in this I mean it, it um, s supplied our material for teaching in the form of its papers it also over the years began to kind of create the contours of the discipline mm. so that we, we had a, all shared an understanding of what we were about Mm. And do you think there's been a shift in the sort of scope and purpose of the journal since those early years? Uh, you, well, I guess about halfway through th that period, in, in, in the late 80s, I, I think there was a definite shift because there was um, a, a change in the funding arrangements, mm. which meant that people weren't being funded to do MA courses and this right. sort of thing. And so our teaching was dramatically affected in philosophy mm. education. And some of us wondered, you know, what we were there for any longer, but we were actually saved in the early 90s by the research assessment um, uh, uh, operations mm -hmm. which then came on stream uh, and they threw us a kind of a lifeline um, and after that I mean the the journal uh, began to flourish as it had never flourished and uh, became a kind of a major international global journal. Mm. Mm. Yeah I can see your point about the ref perhaps being a certainly a major contributor to the proliferation of publications mm. in the journal. Obviously that has been good for the journal and for the field mm. as a whole. Um, but I, I wouldn't see the REF in an entirely positive light, though, I think, in terms of its impact on, on the sort of professional daily life of academics, it's actually possibly had rather more negative effects and certainly the, the increased pressure to publish that's gone hand in hand with a sort of mm. massive increase in workload and, and various types of, sort of performance management has led to a situation when I think academics, sort of, certainly people of my generation, are just under such pressure to publish the whole time that I wonder sometimes if anybody actually has any time to read or all the stuff being mm. published and I do worry that there isn't the kind of institutional support for the time and space needed to just engage in conversations mm. and develop sort of sustained philosophical work that, that's so intellectually important mm. because everybody's so busy just trying to get stuff out there and publish. Yeah, yeah, you're abs absolutely right about those problems with the REF. Mm. Um, perhaps I was a bit enthusiastic. When I was talking about um, a lifeline, mm. I, I suppose I meant that we were in choppy waters oh, in, yeah. in, in the 80s and 90s, yeah. and, and we were at least able to survive. Mm. Perhaps I shouldn't have said more than that. Mm. But uh, I think after the 80s, the, 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 the broad consensus as, as to what kind of operation philosophy education was, and what the journal was, and so on, that began to kind of crumble at the edges, mm -hmm. uh, understandably. And um, you, got, you got people pursuing different paths. Mm -hmm. and some people went more into the kind of policy area, uh, and we saw impact come on stream in 1999, that was part of that. Um, other people um, developed their interests in particular philosophers, uh, who had something to say about education from the early days, I mean, uh, from Plato and Aristotle onwards right through to the late 20th century with Wittgenstein and uh, uh, Hannah Arendt and, mm. and so on. Um, and um, 
so that has that has been a shift I think mm. yeah I can see what, what you're talking about certainly just through looking at the contents of the journal compared to mm. what they might have looked like 30 40 years ago although I, I would say that in my view the the papers published in the journal are still concerned with the same central philosophical questions about education so yeah. Broadly speaking, they're, they're sort of papers that are concerned with epistemological questions about knowledge and the nature of learning. They're more mm. political pieces that look at questions of access and provision, mm. Mm. education and power and justice. Mm. Um, but perhaps what's true is that the range of philosophical resources and the traditions that are drawn on in answering those questions are, are somewhat broader and, and perhaps more eclectic than, than used to be the case. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're surely right on, on the um, sort of topics which the mm. general um, uh, 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 writes about. Um, uh, but I, I suppose um, I, I, I still feel that there's been a change, nevertheless, if I put my finger on it, I think it's that, that, that um, in the early days there weren't so many of these articles which mm. depended on a knowledge of a particular philosopher. Uh, I think in the first ten years, for instance, there. If I remember, there were just two. There's one on Rousseau and one on uh, Sartre, I think. Um, that meant that um, people tackled the problems more directly in those days. Mm -hmm. They just went into them. And it also meant that everybody could participate because you didn't feel that you were hampered because you didn't have a, an inside knowledge of Hannah Arendt or something mm -hmm. to be able to understand. Not much. But as... Um, things shifted in, in a more kind of um, scholarly direction, I suppose. Um, uh, um, um, you, this, this was lost a bit, and, and, and um, it meant that the people who participated were increasingly people who, who kind of shared a, a certain kind of profession, uh, a certain kind of academic knowledge about. Mm. Uh, so I, I think there's um, probably a case for returning a bit more to the direct route which we mm. used to follow more systematically. Yeah, I like this idea of the direct route and I can certainly see its appeal mm. um, and it is true that in my teaching for example I often use papers from that sort of earlier period mm. uh, for students who don't have a systematic background in philosophy because um, they are a really good way in to thinking deeply about education mm. in, in a philosophical way without necessarily having to get to grips with with the work of particular philosophers. I, I think an exemplary paper, actually, that I use a lot in my teaching, that perhaps is an example of what you're referring to, is Robert Dearden's paper, Happiness in Education, oh, yeah. which really just gets straight into this question, you know, should happiness be an aim for education, which is mm. just as topical now as it was when he wrote it. Um, and it really allows students to, to get to grips with the deep philosophical questions that are implied in that, about flourishing, about the meaning mm. of life without having necessarily read Aristotle. Mm. Um, and it's quite striking to me, actually, now looking at the paper, how few references it has. And I think mm. people just don't write like that very much mm. anymore. You're right, that was a great paper, I remember that well. I wonder if I could ask you a question, Judith. I, I mean, how, how do you see the future of the journal from here on in? Um, well, it's hard to comment on the way the discipline will go, but. One thing I, I would like us to pay more attention to, perhaps, as, as a society and as an editorial team, is thinking about ways that we can reach a readership who might not necessarily be part of the academic philosophy of edu education community. I, I think so much of what philosophers of education are saying is really relevant to practitioners, you know, teachers, policy makers, and so much of the sort of popular debate around education now, I think, is really sort of impoverished and could benefit mm. from some some good mm. philosophical work, a lot of which I think teachers are really interested in and, and mm. want to engage in and are quite capable of engaging in, but I worry that perhaps they're not reading what we're writing and sometimes I worry that we're talking to ourselves mm. a bit. And we should do more to engage with other audiences. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more on that, I think. And, and um, perhaps the, you know what I was saying about people's involvement in... Um, um, I could, uh, look, look at particular philosophers probably hasn't helped this process because mm. it, it may have exacerbated this, this idea that we're talking very much to ourselves and um, it would be good if we could move away from that a, a bit I think I mean if you think of um, 
if you think of another case, if you think of something like medical ethics, for instance, <laughs> um, which um, looks at issues like euthanasia and um, patient autonomy and this sort of thing, it would be very odd, wouldn't it, if, if um, a lot of their work was, was via the lens of historical figures which are important in their field, from Hippocrates and Galen through, mm. to, through to Descartes on mind mm. and body, through to Papineau today or something like that. Um, so I, I think in, in, in our case, in, in, in education, if we really want to connect with teachers and other educators, I, I think there's a, a strong case for moving more towards this direct route we've both been talking about. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Mm.